All right. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Terry White here, along with Andre LaRue. Andre, how you doing? What's up, Terry? You're not in New York today. I am not. I am in where the original White House was founded, Philadelphia. Um, I saw it yesterday, and it was it was just like a like a small home. It was very strange. Um, yeah, no, it's it's very hilly. I can see fall. Um, and they're Eagles fans, and I feel bad for them. Although I'm a Dolphins fan, so I have not much to say. <laughs> All right. With that said, welcome, everyone. Ooh. Welcome to Adobe Live. This is our photo editing stream uh, with special guest Andre LaRose. going to be talking about photo editing for the next couple of days, for the next couple of hours. Um, for those of you who are new, welcome to Adobe Live. If you happen to be watching this on YouTube or some other place, be sure to head over to b.net slash Adobe Live so that we can actually see your questions and see the chat. Um, there, I see some people over in the YouTube chat, but it, you know, I can't really pay attention to all these windows at the same time. So we're just going to pay attention to the main one, which is b.net slash Adobe Live. All right, or yeah, be done this slash, slash Adobe Live. And Andre is, uh, again, our special guest for today. And oops, let's put that in the right place. There we go. And he's going to be covering uh, photo editing for um, using Lightroom and maybe some Photoshop, but definitely some Lightroom for sure. And before we get too far into it, I do want to point out what's going on for today. For those of you who are... Um, just tuning in and maybe you haven't been on earlier today. So we do have a full schedule today. Uh, we started off with getting started with uh, even Abrams. Uh, then we did the Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge with Voodoo Val. We'll be taking a look, I think, of some of those entries um, a bit today. Now we're in the photo editing with Andre. And then after us will be the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge with Andrew. And then um, Branding and Identity with Julia. The XD Daily Creative Challenge follows her, and then draw along with Kyle Webster, and then finishing it off will be the design off with Voodoo Val and uh, and Victor. So full packed agenda as we always like to have here on Adobe Live for you guys to uh, just learn all day, every day. So Absolutely. with that said, Andre, tell us a little bit about what they can expect for the next couple of days. So expectations. Lightroom has some brand new features that Terry and I are going to discuss. Um, as I've gotten really, this is probably my, my fourth or fifth time getting to stream with Terry. And it's always really exciting because he's been able to use uh, these features for longer than I have. So I learn new things along with you. Um, we're going to be talking about color. Um, we're going to be touching back on color mix, obviously. But the primary things I want to focus on are versions. And I want to really spend time on adjustment brush. Um, there have been some changes to make it more expansive um, or the features more expansive and fine tune on the iPad. That's where we're using the pencil. Um, we're also going to look at a couple different pieces of work. We're going to talk about um, a little bit of mobile photography. And I'm going to show you some examples of mobile versus, um, versus what I shot on my 5D, just so you kind of get an idea that no matter what level you're coming to, Lightroom is the right tool for you to like continue to organize your images and edit them, get them exported in the way that you want. So um, as always, any questions you have, like Terry and I are happy to steer toward that, but I'm gonna be speaking about current work that I'm doing um, that doesn't have an NDA and just talking about my ethos for how I edit it. And then I think tomorrow specifically, we're gonna spend a lot of time editing some of your photos together, Terry and I, which is pretty cool. That's right. Um, so I'll put the link in the chat, but we're also taking user submissions. So if you have a photo that you would like to see how Andre or I would edit it. You can submit that photo, and we've already got a bunch of entries for tomorrow. So if you just want to join us for that, uh, we'll be editing user submissions uh, tomorrow. I see a bunch of cool people in the chat. Hey, Sean, Steve, uh, Paco's in the house. Uh, oh, Paco, Andrea. what's up, man? Paco, yay, Paco. Uh, Steve's in the house. 
Uh, so welcome. I think I said Steve twice. But welcome everyone. It's the same Steve. There aren't two. Uh, but welcome everyone in the chat. And um, Andre, I'm going to put you on the spot. You held up something a few minutes before we started. Yes. You have a brand new camera. Tell I us do. About that new camera. I do. You know, this is a, there's a bunch of photographers in this stream as well. This is super important, Terry. I know that I'm happy you knew that I brought all sorts of goodies today. And you came prepared to ask me about it. I also have the show and tell. Come on. I have the 12 Pro somewhere that I will grab also. Um, and we can talk about LIDAR for a second because I know that you know all the things. So um, for folks that I normally that have seen me stream before, you know that primarily I shoot on the 5D Mark IV. Um, I, I think it more out of, I don't know if it was poverty, not the right word, but not just having a lot of money when I was in college. I um, got really used to shooting with prime lenses. So my normal kit is a 35, an 85, and a 50. Um, over time, that 35, 85, and 50 got to be a little bit better lenses. Um, so now I have the 35 1.4 um, and the 50 1.2. But that doesn't mean that you can't take great images uh, with whatever you have. So normally I shoot on the Mark IV, but because um, I'm in Philadelphia because I shoot stills for a TV show, I'll call United Shades of America with W. Kamau Bell. And for that TV show, I'm required to photograph um, while they're doing interviews. And so using a mirrorless camera is really important because the shutter on a um, DSLR is loud just naturally because the mirror is coming mm -hmm. up and dropping down. And so the mirrorless camera, you can either have it silent or near silent so that the sound person is not always looking over your shoulder like, what are you doing? Um, yeah, it's so weird pressing the shutter and not hearing anything. It's just- Yeah, it's, it's super strange. Quiet. I know it's like mirrorless cameras. They do have that advantage. Can Terry? Can it? If I were to take a photo, could it pick it up as an example? I just just so Philip looks down. So if I was taking a photo, it's like, wait, hold on. I don't know if y'all can hear this. Like, yeah, that doesn't here. seem like Definitely. doesn't seem like a big deal. But if you were listen, watching a movie, you're listening to a TV show, you'd hear that. It would be very distracting. And so set photography is something that I do that generally I don't get to share as a lot because I'll photograph something like a like now and then it'll come out a year from now. And like there's uh, deals about when it comes out, but the photos get used for things like um, like the like Hulu or Netflix, like that little photo that they have in the still. It can get used mm -hmm. for like a billboard, a digital ad, something like it's all super different. Um, and it's definitely a job that I didn't know. I didn't really think about existing when I first got into photography. So um, if you, for example, like me, are really interested in film, one thing that you can do to get um, some more experience is just offering any filmmaker you know to take stills for them just to get used to it. It's kind of an interesting job because you can like basically be over the shoulder of the primary camera and photograph. Um, but yeah, the, R, uh, the R6, it's pretty cool. It's quiet. I believe the sensor is the same one as the, 1DX Mark III, yeah, but it's, it's really funny. small. They won't, they won't admit it, but everyone mm -hmm. says that it is, and for a fraction of the cost, from what I understand. Yeah, this was um, $2,500, which is a lot of money, um, but it's something that I use for work, and so for me, I will be cheap to no end, Terry can tell you, when it's non-work things, but for delivering the best stuff and trying to get um, the best things for clients, I'm happy to pay for it, and in terms of cameras, this is cheap. Um, and it's great. You can add a little converter to put your EF mount lenses, or they have the RF mount ones where there's another ring and you can control like a third thing like aperture or ISO just on the lens instead of having to fiddle back here, which is pretty cool. Very cool. Um, just for the chat, what are y'all shooting on? Um, are you looking for a new camera? Are you looking for some stuff? I know Terry shoots on Nikon. I, we, I think we both used Sony and Fuji before. Um, we, I get this question a lot, I know Terry does. I can't stress this enough for, for myself, I would tell you that it's all about the lenses you get or have access to and what the UI of the camera is. You want your camera to feel like something you can pick up and um, and just not have to, just naturally be able to pick up and use without having to pull your hand back and look down. Um, because you never know when like that decisive moment of that great photo will come and being comfortable enough with the moment to be able to capture it is like something that makes a lot of sense for me. So I just started using Canon when I was in I don't know, a freshman in college, and it just kind of stuck. Yeah, Sean says Nikon. Steve says I use an old Nikon, but love it, though. Um, is that Fury says uh, Nikon all the time. Cody Bear says I have a, a Canon uh, T5, T5i. Shout out to um, T5i. Canon. Yep. 5D Mark II for Andre. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Andrew. Um, Michael, Canon, T6 Rebel, and 
is that Mercurial? Uh, Canon and Sony. So I'm a I'm a Nikon shooter, and I did just order the Z6 II, so the second mm. generation of that camera, and uh, <laughs> scheduled to ship sometime in middle of November. So I'm anxious to nice. see that one. Terry, I'm I'm so sorry. Is it is it Nikon? I'm so sorry that I've been, I've been saying it wrong. Well, no, no, it's, it's we in the United States pronounce it Nikon, but everywhere else in the world <laughs> is Nikon. That's so, so embarrassing. I'm, I'm trying to get in the habit of pronouncing it the Nikon. correct way. <laughs> it's Nikon. Um, Y'all, this is why you watch Terry's streams. Funny. I'm learning something live right now. Yeah, it's funny when I, uh, we were on a trip to South Africa and the South we, we got a tour of the Nikon facility there. And, of course, everyone's pronouncing it that way. I'm like, why are they saying it? Oh, I guess I'm wrong. <laughs> they, you know, they, they know the pr proper way to pronounce their, their company's name, I'm sure. Um, so, yeah, it's just it's a U.S. thing versus a everywhere else in the world thing. Okay. Um, and a couple quick notes before we get further in. Um, for Adobe Max, I know that any of the sessions that didn't have um, celebrities, I believe you can still watch those recordings. So there are topics like obviously Terry and um, the other evangelists and other streamers like myself um, cover a lot of things on our streams. Um, hopefully, uh, Terry, if you can throw my Behance uh, URL in the chat and or Instagram. They already, yeah, Cody, Cody Bear has already got you covered. She already did. Well, I appreciate y'all. Um, but uh, if there's something specific you wanted to learn from, like Adam JK, I know was a speaker at Max this year. I believe that the um, the videos from that are available throughout the rest of the year if you just go to max.adobe.com and if you have an Adobe account. So please make sure you check those out. Number two, um, if you're US-based, if you are gonna vote, please vote. If you're not, make a voting plan and register in the future. Um, election day is coming and we take our civic responsibility seriously. Um, now, I know that mo almost all of you have used Lightroom in the past, um, but for anyone that's coming in new, I just wanted to give a quick little introduction as to what we're looking at. We're looking at Lightroom on the iPad. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Terry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch you over. Let's do that. And... <laughs> you said, all right. This way we were like, no, no, no. I was like, oh, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Is this, is this a stream on Audition? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, um, it's all you. <laughs> so, um, I apologize if I can't see all in the chat. What I was trying to do was keep the chat on my phone, and it was too much. So I'm just going to focus on this. So um, there are two versions of Lightroom. There are Lightroom Classic and Lightroom, the flagship product. I'm currently using Lightroom, the flagship product. It's a cloud-based service. Um, I know for a while we were calling it cloud or Lightroom CC. I don't know. It's a little confusing. Um, but I know. Just... It's, 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 I, I really try and enforce the name now. It, it is Lightroom, and then there's Lightroom Classic. And at a minimum, I'll say LRC when I'm talking about Lightroom Classic and LR. So mm -hmm. it's just, you know, we call it, we call the other one so many names just to not confuse people. But by giving it all these names, you're confusing people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so 100%. Lightroom, sometimes referred to as Lightroom Mobile, sometimes referred to as Lightroom Cloud, sometimes referred to as, you know, whatever. It is Lightroom. The one that you know we've used for the last decade or so. Lightroom Classic. So those are the names. Those are the official names. Love it, hate it. Those are the names. Um, and so uh, this is Lightroom flagship. Lightroom, Lightroom, Lightroom. Let's make sure we're saying it. Uh, this is a cloud-based service versus um, Lightroom Classic. Lightroom Classic is one that based on your computer storage, or if you're a crazy person like Terry and I, you have many other pieces of storage because you have so many images, you can't fit them all. Um, but they generally work the same. Lightroom is essentially bridge meets camera raw. So it's a way to organize your images and edit them. Um, I, I, for the folks that are like excited about new features, we're totally gonna get into those, but there are a couple folks that had mentioned to me this can be their first time. So I just wanna make sure that everyone feels welcome. And um, so we're gonna go a little slow to start and I want you to bear with me. So when you land in Lightroom, um, just to call out a few things, I just, oh, it's on. I thought my touches wasn't on. Um, over here on the left, this is your library or your photos. It looks like a couple books leaning over. Um, just really fast, you have your all photos. Um, you have these kind of like smart galleries up here based on recent edits, recently added um, photos, Lightroom camera photos that you took. Um, and then further down here, there are albums. Now you'll see that these have little folder icons that might be confusing to you. Um, a, <laughs> a folder is like, think of a folder. A folder doesn't hold photos, a folder holds albums. Albums hold photos. So you're in your albums category. Um, I organize based on year, and then I do month, 
day, year, underscore client. And if it's a client I work with a lot, I'll just put the um, the underscore of what it is after that. But I would really encourage you to keep your things organized. And then also I have things like stuff for streaming or stuff for presets. And so you'll see I have um, the names of a folder and then inside of that I have my albums. And then at the bottom, these are projects that I'm not completed with yet. So I just want to make sure that I um, <laughs> want to make sure that I finish them and then I place them. Uh, as a quick side note, <laughs> if you guys want to hear a joke, right here you'll actually see some photos. I had to teach uh, Ludacris the Rapper um, from Terry's Own Atlanta how to be a food photographer last week. And so <laughs> there are some very mediocre photos that I tried to take while teaching over Zoom. Um, but there are all, all sorts of fun things that we're going to delve into today. Um, one that I'm particularly excited to show Terry because I never shoot things like this. Um, and Terry is very good with his angles and his geometry. Um, but that is kind of organization. The main things that um, I want to draw attention to in this beginning portion are um, your tutorials and your daily inspir and your daily inspiration. So tutorials are a really helpful way to be kind of handheld through how Lightroom works through the eyes of folks like me, Terry, um, my friend Julia Nimke. There's a lot of different artists in here. I can't find Terry's. The only, I think the only issue right now is it's hard to search for folks. Um, but if you go through, you can see a ton of different like things, different kinds of work. So lens flares, architecture, um, food, portraits, like things like that. Um, and they have these kind of cool, um, we'll just walk through Chris's. I've actually not seen this before, but um, essentially when you click through this, it'll load. It'll show you the number of steps in the bottom, and then it's almost written like a little bit of a chapter book so that um, when you approach it, you can understand exactly what they're doing. Also, when you, um, if we go back, excuse me, oh, hold on. Try this again. You'll see that it says, well, here where it says color, it says like what the primary um, goal with the editing is. It'll say beginner, intermediate, intermediate, or advanced. So it meets your skill level. And then it talks about which areas it works on. So color, light, effects. And so if you're looking for something that'll help you understand geometry better, so maybe you wanna um, understand how to make those guided lines, or maybe you need to understand how folks are editing um, their travel photography. Like it, this is a really good way because instead of, maybe if you've seen a lot of streams and you're like, okay, like I'm trying to work while I'm listening to Terry, I'm listening to Andre, I'm listening to Julie, I'm listening to whoever or whomever, um, and it's hard to work alongside. This is great because as it as you walk through each spot, it'll prompt you to go through each portion, show you exactly what the person did. Oh, cropping's hard. <laughs> Cropping is hard. Oh, because I see what I was trying to do is I was trying to pull exactly, from the corner. Yeah, I was trying to pull yeah, from the corner. To line up to ex exactly yeah. what they did. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you, I'll I let you go forward. Yeah, I always crop from the corner. So I was like, what the heck? Yeah, so then it'll show you like, oh, this is how you crop. Then you keep going through each step and it'll say, this is how you're seeking the light. This is what I'm looking for. Um, and I find these helpful because if I am having a hard time understanding maybe the nuance between exposure and highlights or exposure and whites or blacks and shadows, I can see that folks use it in different ways. So like for me, for example, um, I refer to exposure and saturation and sharpening as kind of like dumb tools. They um, work across the spectrum of it to edit everything evenly. And so I might say here, well, let's talk about what I want to do. Let's look at what this person does. Um, Melissa's talking about darkening the bright tones to recover some detail. So you see like that's how they're using highlights. Some people use it differently, um, but because she brought her exposure up, she wanted to make sure that she didn't lose any detail back over here um, in these mountains and stuff. So just these guided tutorials are really helpful because they're a good way for you to say, I want to understand all of these advanced features or basic features on my own time. You can get them on your phone, you can get them on your iPad, you can get them on a tablet. I, I apologize for um, being more Apple centric. I know that everyone has different devices, but they should be available on all devices where you can get the Lightroom app or on your desktop, obviously. And then on the right, there's something that's pretty fun. Let's pick this dog because who doesn't like a cute dog? Um, that's are called that are called discover files. Now these are like guided tutorials light. They show you how someone edited an image. So you'll see as you work through, it'll show you the beginning to the end. But if you swipe up from the bottom, 
it'll show you exactly what the photographer did to edit through the image. So adding a profile, adding exposure. Oh, adding some vibrance. Let me look at what happens when I go from blacks to vibrance. You can see how the color is changing. Um, but the coolest part is when you get to the very end, you can save it as a preset. I'm not sure why this one didn't, um, didn't light up, but you can hit save as preset. You know what, I'm just, I'm just gonna look at my own stuff because I know that that's there. <laughs> this is what happens when you uh, look at other people's work. So um, we go through this photo of Rafa. We see how I used curves. Great, we get all the way to the end. Oh, I wonder why that is, Terry. Do you know why it's not allowing me to show this as a preset right now? I don't know. Um, it should, but that is basically what he's what he's saying or trying to show is that that is one of the features of these discover files is that if you see one that you like and you like the look of it, yep. you can actually save it as a preset to apply to your own photograph. So um, let me see if it works on mine. Let me pop mine open real quick. And if it doesn't, while Terry's pulling that up, I have um, some presets that are from these one, two, three, four, five, six top photos um, that are made yep. available for free through Lightroom. Um, I can drop that link into the chat in a second. But if you um, want them, I can give them to you. They're really easy for you to get available. And if you if you don't have uh, Lightroom on your desktop, you can still get them on your computer. I mean, excuse me, on your phone by simply saving them on through the link that we send. Um, and then these discover files are a good way for you to just get an idea maybe of like quicker edits. Um, all of this yeah. is just about getting you comfortable enough with Lightroom so that you can make what you want. Um, this isn't saying like Terry's an actual expert. I'm a person that um, he feels bad for and occasionally lets onto a show. Um, but whatever you make um, is your art. And so just getting you as comfortable as possible to say, oh, I wish this is a- Wait, 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 wait. Who did Ludacris call to have them teach you or me? All right, I'm, so, I'm leaving. So there, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a hilarious conversation. Um, anyway, I um, the point is that if you, like, it's a beautiful fall day here, but it is a little gray. And let's say you're only in Philly for the day and you want to take a beautiful photo of the foliage and this is your last time to do it. Um, being able to understand how to, like, maybe increase your highlights and warm it up or add a little bit of um, yellow or orange to your highlights through split toning is something that, like, might take time to figure out. But if you're on the train or you're on a flight and you just want to look through it, it's like this is built for you to be able to learn quickly and um, apply in different ways. Uh, Terry, can you show right. it? I can't. I can't. Yeah, I do. Show. I have it on. I have it on a desktop. So I'm uh, gonna pop open mine. And so here I'm looking at my Discover, not only my Discover tab, but uh, the, again the new feature in this October release is the following tab of the Discover panel. And so these are the photographers I'm following and their latest work. And I'm sure Andrew is in here too. But if you see one that you like, so for example, if you hover over one, you'll see the before and after. And when you see it, you can say, oh, I really like how that came out. Uh, when I click on it, it'll walk me through, as Andre uh, described, step by step, everything she did to get to this look. But at the very bottom, I don't even have to wait for it. I can click the Save Preset button here at the bottom and say, you know, it's called Morning on the Lake by Katrin Eisman. It's even letting me check off all the things I want as part of that preset or don't want. So, for example, if I didn't like... I don't know, I'll just pick something random. If I didn't like her linear gradient, I can turn that off and say, apply everything she did except the linear gradient to my photos. So then when I save that as a preset, which I'll do, uh, oh, I already have it. So, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I don't have to replace it or do anything. Now, if I were to go to one of my photos, um, I would be able to, here, let's see if I can find a landscape really quickly here. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Well, oh, that's not a landscape, but I have one in here. So I can go to this one, even though it's not the same kind of photo, but I can go in here and then go into, uh, oh, not the film strip. If I were to go into my edits, here we are. And then go to my presets and then go down to my user presets or saved presets. There it is. Morning on the Lake by Katrina Eisman would do that to this photo. But keep in mind, this is not a sunset or sunrise, so it's, I don't expect it to do the same kind of thing. But that's where your presets will be saved that you applied from other people or that you saw from other people and saved. And then you'll be able to um, even hover over them to see what they would do to your photo. So while I didn't like that one, I do like her Graceful Swans preset on this particular photo. 
so I can apply that one if I like that one better. Mm -hmm. So very cool to be able to do that uh, with other people's looks and work that they submitted. And I'll point out one more thing is that when the tutorials were first introduced, they were only only um, only people that could submit were people that were approved to submit tutorials. But with the Discover files, anyone with Lightroom can submit one. So if you did an edit to a photo that you really liked, all you'd have to do is just go up to your share menu. Let me get my button back over here. Go to your share menu and you can share that edit. So you can just hit share edit and share your own. And then people can follow your work. Also, one more thing I, I figured out about the following mm -hmm. is that you can't search for people as you as you ran into, Andre, but you mm -hmm. but the people that you follow on Behance are already mm -hmm. automatically followed in here. Oh, vice versa. okay. So uh, people that followed you on Behance are automatically following you in Lightroom. Just so okay. you know. I did not know that. That's great. So follow folks I on found out, yeah, Make sure I you're found following out I was like, how are thousands <laughs> of people following me in this Lightroom feature that just happened? It was like, oh, because <laughs> these are Behance followers. Okay, I get it now. Oh, that makes total <laughs> sense. That makes total sense. Um, just uh, as a quick thing, I... I know that we mentioned it already, but um, Behance has been kind enough to give me the opportunity to uh, stream weekly. I actually just moved apartments, so um, I didn't stream last week, but that means I'll probably be doing like eight hours in the next like four days. So um, please, when I'm back in New York, if you have any questions, like DM them to me on Behance, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. I'm happy to make streams about it. So um, that is essentially the organization of Lightroom is a quick, um, we're not gonna get too much into it, but down here is the camera. Um, play with it when you get a chance. Um, just the bottom left corner, you can switch between automatic and professional and you'll be very happy, particularly at the very top of the screen. You can switch between having a DNG, a digital negative or a JPEG. Although DNG will take up more space on your phone, it'll give you um, more opportunity to, it's a raw file, so you'll have um, more opportunity to edit your image. And just as a quick little plug for my favorite feature, um, actually, we'll do my mask up here. Please keep your mask on. Um, this is your focusing. So you'll see these green lines will let you know what's in focus and what isn't. Um, and obviously, you can move stuff away and still get like a nicer depth of field because you're um, able to control your focusing. The reason why that matters is um, for any mobile camera, generally, you tap and press to expose your lock and expose your focus. Um, which is cool for a lot of things, but if for whatever reason you need to have your exposure and your focus be different, actually, let me get this open. Um, you can set your set your focus to, let's say, you know, Terry proposes to me, I have a beautiful ring on my finger, I wanna hold, show that off. But I think that because the slights can be in my hand looks too light, so I can change my exposure compensation um, while still focusing on this, which is something that you haven't had the ability to do. And you can hit this top, this bottom corner and lock your exposure. Um, that way, even if you tap the screen or anything wild happens. Oh, Terry, did you know that if you tap on it, it gets all your fingers? I did not know that. That's awesome. Um, if you tap on the screen, you'll notice that nothing changes until I untap exposure lock. Lastly, um, although I would never use this, you can go through and add presets to your photos um, when you're shooting. The reason I would never use it is you can always edit it later. And it's a great segue into um, using versions where you can um, make a lot of different edits. And then in, if you're indecisive like me and you're unsure which edit you like, instead of making one, exporting it, making another, exporting it, and they'd be like, wait, what did I do to do here and go here? Um, I can take this image of my friend Maria. Let's use one, we, yeah, let's use one that we like a little better. Um, and one second. I can hit this fun little member here and I can have versions. So there's my original, obviously. So this kind of like works, kind of works like snapshots on Photoshop where I have my original, I have my current, but I can keep making new versions where I hit create version. Maybe I can say black and white. Um, it's this like little, if it's me tap on again, it's this little like half circle with the time in it. It looks like that um, the time machine logo um, if you have an Apple device. And so it'll organize it based on when you did it. Um, if I made a couple more, this is how it would look. 
but um, auto actually shows you what you did at certain times. And it says tablet. So like, just like we said, it's an, um, the Lightroom program is integrated across your phone, your tablet and all these things. So it can be helpful for you to see different edits throughout. Um, but I realized before I get so ahead of myself, I do need to talk about what these other uh, tools are just really quickly. So first one on your top right is most of your editing tools. So uh, light is are the things you'd imagine, your exposure, contrast, highlights, whites, and things like that. Um, this, These are your curves. Color, something new that Terry and I are going to talk about probably the end of today or tomorrow is color grading. Um, this is, makes it your color makes your ability to color a little bit a little bit more similar to what you were doing on Premiere, which is still confusing to me, um, but I'm doing my best. Effects is kind of where we tuck in high some of our coolest features like texture and clarity, dehaze, um, and grain for the folks, as well as split toning, which you can get right here. Oh, it now just directs you directly to color grading. Okay. Yeah, uh, color grading replaced split toning. Which makes sense. I mean, it, de it definitely makes sense. I didn't, um, I haven't used the iPad since Max. And so the fact that it just was like, no, I was like, all right, cool. Um, details are sharpening. And, and theory, I, I love uh, manual mode as well for the camera. That's one of the main reasons I use the Lightroom camera as opposed to yep. just the camera built into the device. Yep. The, the app, I should say. You're still using yep. the same hardware. Yep. And um, Michelle says she loves your photography. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I say this on every stream, and I mean it. Uh, people like Terry and Terry specifically make ways for um, other people like me to uh, have jobs and to like a pathway for the, on the internet. So every time you thank me, make sure you thank Terry twice. So uh, optics no, no, is you, just you like you take your own pictures. I'm not there, so you, <laughs> you're doing. Listen, it. that might be true, but um, Terry's videos help me understand how to do specific things I didn't know how to do. Terry has taken time to make sure that I, I shares my platform with me. Like, don't let this man pretend like he's not. So many things we are better off at because of Terry and Paul and these people that really work hard um, to get that ready. Geometry, we're gonna, I have a specific thing I can't wait to show you about. You should get totally excited. Um, we're gonna get into that in a minute. But those are your basic right, we got a, panel got features. A quick question here. I just want to do it before before it passes on and I don't see mm -hmm. it anymore. So Fira's asking, well, what's the difference between split toning and, and the brand new color grading? Oh, and cool. in a nutshell, the biggest difference is color grading's got the highlight shadows and midtones, where split toning, I believe, was just, just had the highlights, and, highlights and, shadows. and shadows. That's that's as far as the what you can do, that's probably the biggest difference. But there's a whole different realm of color that color grading falls into when you talk in terms of making photos match or look a particular way okay. that were maybe taken under different lighting conditions. So that's it in a nutshell, but let's hang on until Andre gets to it to where he's actually going to show it. Yeah, I'm happy to show it. Um, <laughs> sorry, I know it's, it's tough because I, I was so excited to jump into versions and I was like, wait a minute, let's... No, 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 go ahead. You don't have to do it now, but I just wanted to give them that, yeah. that definition before that Absolutely. question moved on. Um, and if you have a question about the difference between uh, midtones... Hold on. Oop. There we go. Um, just look at this image. The histogram uh, lets you know, like... You'll see that as I'm moving my highlights and shadows, um, you'll see the histogram is changing. If you want to get an idea of what your midtones are, um, just like you would think, like here in Maria's hair, these are your shadows. Um, this bright part of her face where you can tell where the light's coming from, those are your highlights, but your midtones are a lot of everything else, like possibly even the screen behind her, um, the blue on her necklace, like all these things that aren't, that are essentially in the, in the center. Um, so color grading gives you the opportunity to work with those things. Just to clarify a little bit more, uh, geometry we talked about, um, presets we've touched on. So you, there are some free ones that Lightroom makes available to you, like um, these black and white ones from Greg Noir, some cinema ones from um, Sam Harin. Um, and if you save them, you'll get them saved, some, some, some from Mastin. Anytime you save them, they'll save into this uh, category called saved presets, and you save them through using the um, discover files that I showed you. So if you ever don't know where they are, they're sitting right in here and they're named.
based on what the person named them. I obviously would never use this. I'm just showing you as an example. Um, it'll say like the name of it and then it'll say the name of the person. Um, this is just a good example of presets are um, a way for you to start and to understand, but often they really only work with certain lighting conditions, certain skin tones. So just be careful, even if you have a favorite preset, not just to slap it on things. Um, something worth touching on because I passed over it is right here on this top, uh, top right in the uh, edit panel is profile. Um, I know that I still think that you get questions about what the difference between a preset and a profile is. The best way I can describe it is just like we're talking about cameras, um, the photo that you see in the back of your camera um, looks a little different on the back of your camera than it does on your computer because your camera makes certain decisions um, about how it wants to show it to you. So there's even little camera, there's even profiles in your camera that'll say like um, portrait or landscape and it'll let you know like, oh, I'm sharpening this or I'm bringing this up and down. Um, essentially your profile is your, your base point. So you can alter like, I'm gonna read colors this way. Um, and then from there, um, you can then go and get started. But the difference between a preset and a profile is if I select this edit as my profile, after I hit back, you'll see that actually none of my um, edit features have changed, nothing. It's just like, even if I press and hold and go through, it looks, as far as uh, Lightroom is concerned, we're starting from a different way to read the data. It's a, it's a profile for the, the camera versus presets are like, when you're buying different film, like if you were getting Xperia 400 or if you were getting like Portra 1600, like your ability to alter things is different, but it does kind of walk you to a similar area and place. I, I don't know if that was, if it was confusing, please let me know and I can try to clarify. Also, Terry, if you have any thoughts as to how to clarify that, let me know, but that's the best way I've found to describe it. Yeah, uh, you, you hit the main point was that, that a profile does not move any sliders. That's the best way to look at it. So you can apply a different starting point, you know, whether it's black and white or more vibrant or portrait or any of the raw profiles or the creative profiles. But then when you apply that profile and you look at your edit sliders, they're all where they originally were. Yeah. So it's, it's a way to get a starting look for your photo without moving any of the adjustment sliders to make your photo look a certain way. And, but often a lot of these Adobe ones, just so you know, like, this one's a little more saturated, a little bit more sharp. It's landscape for a reason. If you think about the landscapes that you're taking and what you're trying to get out of those images, like that's how it works. So just to give you an idea, I'm gonna go ahead and leave this on neutral because I actually kind of enjoy a flat image. Now we'll go to standard where we were. So that's the edit panel, that's the preset panel. Um, cropping, we understand, but just something to keep in mind with the aspect. Um, if you keep on original, Oh, okay. Um, you, as you slide from a corner, you can just keep that um, the same aspect ratio. But also, if you're having a hard time, I know for um, some people, they'll take a photo and then um, let's say for some, for some reason you're shooting a nine by 16 and you're like, oh man, I didn't think it was gonna look like this on Instagram. And like, I don't want Instagram to crop it. Um, I'm worried about how it's gonna compress the image. Um, you can just choose, choose your crop here get it ready and export it directly to your phone without having to worry about what happens if I airdrop it or what happens, actually, I don't think airdrop's an issue. What happens if I um, email it to myself or anything like that? How is it going to compress? Um, since you're using a cloud-based service, you can feel really confident that um, Lightroom would handle the image properly and you can get it ready for export. Um, I'm not sure, I'm sure Terry can tell me, the only thing I'm not sure about for versions is if I crop, will it, can I keep certain crops just in certain versions, but everything else I know is fine. I know they're straight in here, yeah, but I the, try to avoid that. Go ahead. Lightroom versus classic. So Lightroom, for whatever reason, I noticed in the past, I haven't tried it with the versions. Yeah. Does it like like for example, if you made a preset in classic, if you made a preset with a crop, it would apply the crop as well. Mm -hmm. Or if you selected multiple images with a crop and do a crop, it would crop multiple images. For whatever reason, the new Lightroom doesn't take crop into the same consideration yeah so i'm i haven't tried it on a on, on um on a version yet to see if it it crops it i would imagine it should because it's not destructive yeah i but wonder it should it shouldn't but i just that's the only thing i would say that's I'm certainly that you easy up. enough to test uh here let me let me let me do one. Yeah. <laughs> let's just go in and yeah let's crop one real quick go ahead go keep talking i'm gonna go test it real quick so um, that's your crop. 
here's your healing brush. So healing brushes, um, also to be very clear, we are not, well, I'm not in the business of making folks look plastic or um, making them look like themselves. But for example, if like Maria has this, I chose this image because she just has a tiny blemish from that day. Um, I mean, I have like pimples over the place, it's wild. You'd think that I'd be done with this at this age, but who knows. Um, but the way the healing brush works, we're not gonna talk too much about it, so we're just gonna show you an example, is um, you can either clone or heal. Clone allows you to copy pixels from another part of the image. Heal allows Lightroom to sample the pixels in the area so that what you select, it should fill in by essentially intelligently cloning around the area, um, like a little bit of concealer would. Um, size lets you alter how big or small um, your brush is. And then feather, essentially if you see, let me bring the size of this again. Okay, so if I bring my feather down, you see how this makes like one hard circle. If I start to change my feather more and more, you'll see that um, essentially the edges get softer. Um, I personally like a good feather because it allows me the latitude. If I like accidently get right here, um, well, that's a terrible idea, but if I accidentally get to one spot, it's not gonna immediately harshly um, apply the apply the edit all the way around the edges because I'm not the most accurate editor. And so having a feather gives me a little leeway when I'm filling in. Opacity allows you, it's kind of like flow on Photoshop. So it allows you to just um, have a slightly less aggressive, uh, slightly less aggressive edit. So let's just get this out of here as an example. So and you'll see that now- so to, answer, thing, go ahead. to answer that question, yes, your crops are saved with versions, which I expect Great. So your, should be. Your original version though, if you go to it, or can you have one version that's cropped nine by 16 and one by, that's five by four? Sure, you can have as many right. different versions cropped as many different ways as you want. So shout out to all the social media managers that are happy that now they can optimize in Lightroom for mul the same image for Twitter, Instagram, um, Behance, whatever. Because two by one on Instagram or on Twitter is, <laughs> if you do it wrong, the image can just be, like if it's a picture of me and it's just like, <laughs> Twitter like crop it so it's the fan. So this is just really helpful. Keep versions in mind as you, um, need to give different looks of the same image. So the other thing, just point about the healing brush, you'll see as I move through, it picked an area that it thought was best, but I'm moving, I'll pick a different area and it'll sample it slightly differently. Um, if you change your opacity, it'll show you more or less, you'll see how this like little blemish will disappear. Um, you get done. And now the thing I thought was there is gone. So that's, that's just a quick thing. I'm not, we're not gonna spend a ton of time on healing brush. After this, uh, selective edits are your adjustment brush. We're gonna spend some more time on a little later as we get this image where we want it to go. But essentially the adjustment brush allows you to hyper edit or um, hyper, hyper selective edit a certain area how you want. So if I think, for example, that I hate the color of these, I think this lipstick color is bad or I need it to be stronger, I can go ahead and uh, paint over this. Um, and then I wanna desaturate it or saturate it or um, try to change the color a little bit. Just an example. Now, obviously, some of these things are better to do in Photoshop, but if Photoshop is scary to you um, or layers are exhausting, you Lightroom is getting more and more powerful for, powerful for you to be able to have um, a lot of control of your images, uh, from, even from your phone. So that's a quick walkthrough. Well, the, the other thing to remember in that one example with the lipstick is that you also have the... Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but you also have the local hue to adjust the color. Yep. So because you brushed yep. in her, her lipstick or whatever, you could now go to local hue and just use the, the dot to slide left or right to see what color you like best in place of the color that was already there. We're just gonna show that because local hue is a new feature that Terry was so kind as to remind us of. So let's paint this in. Um, so the, the red you're seeing is not the red it's just showing you the mask. It's not the actual. Yeah. Color. So the, this red is just to say, hey, buddy, this is what you're painting over. Um, if you're doing this on your computer, if you hit the key of um, O, not zero, but like the letter O between I and P, if you're on a US keyboard, um, it, it'll just toggle between showing it to you and not showing it to you. There might be a feature to do that here. I'm not sure exactly how to do it. Oh, no, I think you just, yeah, you can just tap it. So if you tap here, um, it'll show you what, what's pushed in and what's not. And that's helpful so you can just know later like what you're going to do. 
Um, so what Terry was saying was here in our selective adjustments, we have light, shadows, all things are normal. But here we have a new feature. It's pretty badass. It's called local hue adjustment. Um, Terry, could you explain to me what use fine adjustment means? Well, it just means like right now without fine adjustment, if you drag it left or right, you can go crazy. You can go all the way to the left, all the way to the right. You can get, But when you get it to an area where you're trying to say, okay, I like this range of color, but mm -hmm. I don't want to vary that much. It's basically turning the turning the speed of the of the of the the tool way down. So it's like yep, hitting the brick. Right. You can only make a very fine adjustment left or right. So now you'll see I'm not going nearly as quickly, but this looks way more natural. You see, it's way slower as a feature, which is fine. Right. Now this actually doesn't look terrible. I wouldn't use this color, but you'll see. Oh, sometimes my zoom in betrays me. If we're so unsure, we'll tap. Let me just go ahead and paint in this last part because I think the uh, teeth are helpful. Um, let's turn off fine adjustment and let's just slowly go until we find something we like. So that purple might be a lot. Um, that pink might be a little better. We have added more natural color, but maybe I want to make it a little more red. And then I want to switch to fine again. And I want to keep going a little bit. Um, now, I, I have no problems with the color of the lips. I just want to show you as an example. So this local view adjustment is a really fun tool because it allows you the precision of uh, the select color that you have used in Photoshop in the past, but directly in Lightroom. And you can see I'm using this on my iPad. I actually have not tried it on my phone. So I'm going to find out right now if it's even available on my phone. I want to guess. It. Yeah, I want to guess that it is, but I don't want to speak to you and tell you it's not there. And so that's pretty cool. So let's say, for example, you don't have like giant fingers like mine, or you have like uh, an iPad Pro Max or an iPhone Pro Max or um, like a Samsung, was it 12? The new ones that are huge, like the phablets, and you want to go ahead and like draw it with your finger, like totally something you can do. Um, that local adjustment can be really cool. Um, I, I think myself and Terry, we don't make a lot of like photorealist things, but this is an opportunity for you if you, for example, make a collage of images. Um, you could make a ton of different really interesting stuff. You can have colors that go as wild as Lisa Frank or something that's pretty subdued. Um, and that, that range, I think, is really, really cool. So I'm going to show you another example of how maybe I would use that. Now, I don't think this is a good decision, but for this example, we're going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to paint, try to paint the whole background. And while we're doing that, um, I'm sure Terry has something cool to tell us about that I will gleefully or a question or something, because this is probably going to take me a minute. Um, All right. so, so, so <laughs> I see there's some chatter about, um, here, let me see if I can get my mouse in place here. I see there's some chatter about the very first version of Photoshop before being uh, nostalgic. So when Photoshop had its 30th anniversary, I think it was a year or two ago, um, I actually did a recording of what it was like to work in Photoshop 1.0. Really? So share that link right now. Uh, when did that come out? I don't know. I was like, Loki, don't think I was alive for that. <laughs> I'm not even trying to be funny. I'm serious. <laughs> Photoshop 1.0, I think, was around 1986. If oh, I'm not no, mistaken, I don't know. That wasn't alive for that. No, I wasn't alive for that. Yeah. The so, first Photoshop yeah. I ever used was probably four or five, CS5 or four, whatever that was. Oh, no, I take that back. It wasn't that early. It was in the, uh, I want to say the 90s, like 1990. Maybe. Okay. Hey, I'm, I'm drawing, uh, you know what? It's easy enough to Google <laughs> Photoshop 1.0. I was born in 91 uh, in August. So the either in the 80s or early 90s. Photoshop 1.0 came out in da, 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 1990. Yeah, that's what I said. Okay. So yeah, I was thinking nice. the 30-year 30 30 anniversary, so yeah. Nope, still wasn't alive. <laughs> that's, that's February 19, 1990. I wasn't even a thought then. That's wild. I'm impressed. Shout out to Photoshop's longevity. Yeah. 
Um, so if so, you want to see what, what the pain was like to work in Photoshop way back then, you can watch that video at another time and see what it was really like. Oh, I meant to ask you, Terry, have you um, used the new iOS 13, is it 13 we're on, um, function for you to be able to make custom icons? Because I think it'd be really cool if we could get like some of the retro Adobe icons for um, the apps. And if not, I totally think you should lobby for that. I don't know who else is with me, but I think it'd be super rad to use like really old, like old Photoshop <laughs> icons and like- well, you know, think you know, about it. Photoshop's uh, original icon was probably black and white, um, come to think of it. But, cause that was back when, yeah, there was a color display, but I'm not in 1990, but I'm not sure the icons were in color back then, or if they were, they mm. were very basic colors. Interesting. That's so, so someone asked if you were streaming um, in Lightroom from the iPad, and, and Lightroom mm -hmm. does not have direct streaming as of yet. So the only no, three yeah, apps right. that Fresco. Yeah, the only three Adobe apps that have it are Fresco, Photoshop on the iPad, and um, Illustrator on the iPad can live stream directly from the iPad versions. That's so interesting. I. Terry, have you done it before? I haven't. I I, I only do like very complex <laughs> streaming setups, but it would be cool to just be able to sit in my iPad and stream. It'd be, make it so much more like fun. You can. It's it's there. I, well, again, only from those three apps though. So it would be something you're doing only in one of those apps at a time. Does it use the camera on the iPad or like how does it work? Oh, camera, microphone on the iPad plus the app. Wow. I'm gonna try it out. One of my streams. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm curious what I want to make on Photoshop iPad, but totally doable. Okay, cool. So you can stream maybe a retouch, and it will stream to your Behance. Interesting, interesting. Um, and as I've um, in the last since I was an Adobe Creative resident, I've come to really appreciate just as a quick plug for Behance that be what Behance serves is a, an opportunity community build. Like I love, I love Instagram. Like Live is essentially useless. Like it's fun to use for like a conversation, but if I'm showing anyone anything, like um, I find Behance to be cool because it's very process oriented and people really come on there to like skill share and skill learn. And so um, shout out to everyone that's here for Behance. That's no dig to anything else. Behance really carved out a really good place for um, people to learn and like continue to build as a uh, photo community, <sighs> as a creative community. Um, so if we're looking at this uh, background, we're seeing that originally if I tap this once, it was green. Another thing to point out after you tap, you can actually move this around. Um, I'm not telling you to do it, but it's something you can do. Um, you'll see that I made a couple mistakes here on the edges. I tapped her hair, but just for this example, and it's not super necessary that we're hyper um, accurate. But let's say that we were in a studio, we only had a certain backdrop. Maybe we want it to be a little bit bluer. And you'll see that it actually comes out pretty reasonably well here on these edges. I need to clean this up um, because I used my I used a feather. Um, you're not seeing. Oh, I actually also made her skin blue. Excuse me. Tap that. Um, as I'm zooming in and out, I just got to be careful to make sure that my finger's in the right place, or I'm going to do that. Um, but you'll see that even in these spots, it's a little green, and that's because I didn't have my fill all the way on my selective edit. So if I continue to um, to color, you'll see that green kind of go away. But the idea here is that control allowing you to control a color that is even throughout is pretty cool. So we'll keep going. Purple, I can we can all admit doesn't look very good, but maybe something that's a little bit softer, maybe the soft yellow um, can end up looking really nice and actually looks reasonably natural. Um, for a backdrop, I probably would use a color. For a backdrop, I probably would use a color that was reasonably similar to this one. Um, but if, for example, what you used to have to do if you weren't doing that is instead of being able to say, like, I wanted to control this, I hit cancel, I'd go over to color, color mix, I'd go to green, and then I'd play from there. Um, and while this looks more even here, I think that the thing that makes local hue adjustments so interesting is you can say, if for, let's say I wanted to make this a gradient instead, I could just um, darken an area change that hue, color in, like color in this area, change the hue, color in this area, change the hue, and just make it a little bit different. Um, I don't know if I'd make a gradient versus just have a gradient background for a, like just get a great gradient backdrop, but it's something that you can do to alter um, each color in a really, really fine way. So for example here, let's say like 
this image was like this denim was maybe a, the light hit it strange, but it's supposed to be even and blue throughout. Being able to color that in um, and just change that hue locally is really cool. Absolutely. So, so, go ahead. Yeah, and it's it's a local adjustment for not just the brush, as you said. It's the brush. It could be the gradient filter. It could be the uh, radial filter. Any local adjustment can you can apply the local hue to make that change. Yep. Yep. Um, yes, Steve, it is open season. You can stream anywhere um, from your iPad. So uh, that is one of our main features we're most excited about. Just so I just make sure does everyone understand uh, exactly what, or for the most part, what I just discussed is do you have any questions? And are there any new Lightroom features that you want Terry and I to discuss? I have plans for other ones, but I don't want to be presumptive and just dive in. Um, but I am going to do that unless you talk to me, unless you stop me. So, um, so he's open season on features. So, <laughs> what would you? Is there something you guys uh, would like to see as in terms of Lightroom features? Uh, I'd yep. be happy to show. It. Happy to show, or if there's a feature that we don't have that you need. Um, I know that Terry spends his nights writing all the code himself. So you know. Yeah, that's what I do. Sure, uh, I, <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot. While we're waiting for people to chime in, it was something yep. that maybe they want to see or not. What's your favorite new feature in the, since June? So there's the June update, then there's the October update. Between mm -hmm. those two updates, what's your favorite feature? Whoa. Okay. Well, can you remind me of what changed? It's funny because I just, I like will use things and then not remember when it came out. So let <laughs> me not miss me. Well, there's the local hue. There's the versions. There's the auto versions. There's the... Uh, hang on for a minute. There's the ability now to have graphic watermarks. Mm -hmm. There's, I'm trying to I will never use a watermark a day in my life. I, <laughs> I will never do it. I don't care. <laughs> you can steal my photos if you want to. I, I just can't. The watermarks are, it, it, it's pain to me. All right. You got Steve wants to see neural filters for fun, but that's a Photoshop feature. Um, any Lightroom okay. features first? I was like, Steve, we can do that, but um, I'm gonna have to switch to my computer or Terry's gonna have to show you. Um, but no, I would have to say versions. Like truly, I think versions is a really helpful tool. Remember it's down here. Um, I think that the auto versions is cool because it says intelligently like, hey, you made a pretty drastic change on this device. And so we made it available to you. So you don't accidentally make a mistake. <laughs> you don't accidentally lose an edit that you like, but since the edits are non-destructive, isn't it cool to, I think of versions as kind of like a, a tree of, of like a, a branch of choices. It's like um, Sylvia Plath's, is it the fig tree? Um, where all these choices are there. And instead of having to worry about what's, like what your final is, you can make a couple options. And if you have client work, for example, um, and they say like, we want to see this retouched and we want to see it normal. We want it, but we want to keep our edits the same. Instead of you having to go back and do it or export it and re-import it, you can just have it all together in one spot. Um, so for example, let's edit this like I normally would. I'm going to kind of talk you through it and then we're going to do it a couple different ways so you can see why versions might be helpful. So um, normally already with this photo with Maria, we're going to go back. Um, I actually liked how vivid looked. So we'll start on Vivid. I like Vivid because um, here you'll see that it gets, gets good contrast on her. But my first noticing is it seems like it brought the contrast up of how the image is shown. And so I'm gonna go ahead and, actually, you know what? Instead of sliding contrast, we're gonna go to curves. I know Terry and I talked about this in the past, but just to double check for the folks, the uh, curves is a way for you to edit your images. There are um, a couple of different kinds of curves, but right now we're using uh, this guy right here, which is our point curve. We have the point curve for red, for green, for blue, and then this is the parametric curve. Terry, am I right? Uh, this, this one all the way on the right. This one is the parametric, but this is the point. I don't use the parametric. Um, I find it confusing, and so I just go to the point curve because I can alter from points. Um, the way the point curve works for um, the main curve, not for these colors, is the top right corner alters your like this box up here, like right here, alters your highlights the most, and this alters your shadows the most, and then this box in the middle are your midtones. Generally, if you're making an edit, um, people always talk about making an S curve, so you bring uh, your shadows down and your highlights up. Since we already used chose vivid, you'll see that it kind of did that already. So actually, if I let's get out of this, let's go back to color. Um, 
Let's go to our curves and let's do that. Let's bring our shadows down and our highlights up. You'll see that this image is almost exactly <laughs> what Vivid does, um, but we did it ourselves. So uh, if you don't believe me, we'll go over, create a version. Let me put my pen, my Apple Pencil down and just write curves test one, right? And then um, we're going to go back to the original, close that out, go to our profiles, go to Vivid. Um, Vivid might be a little bit more colorful. We'll go back to our versions. We'll create a new version saying Vivid test create. And now we can look between Vivid and curves. So you'll see that versus the original, these two are pretty close. Um, the different, big difference between Vivid is it seems to be a little bit more saturated, but um, it's an example of like, you can do a lot of these things in different ways. Profile is just a base for you to start with. Um, and so let's keep in our curves test. Actually, yeah, we'll keep in our curves test. We'll hit apply. Uh, you'll see that these all these options are still available to you. We're gonna go back to our edits. Um, here, I really love, it's kind of counterintuitive for me to have made this S curve and then reduce the contrast, but I'm gonna bring my blacks up a little. The reason for that is, um, oh, easy killer. Um, I wanna make sure that on her hair, you're seeing like these highlights right here on the edge, but like in here, you can't really see anything. Now you're gonna get, not gonna get all of that back, but one thing I like to do is I like to just go ahead and bring up the left corner of my curve so that you'll see that it's it's bringing the black point up just slightly. Then I can add that shadow back that I wanted and it's just slightly less, oh, it's a little bit flatter of an image, but um, I think it's a little softer in a way that I find a little better. Another way to do that instead um, of sliding through that bottom is to, or sliding the bottom left corner of the curves up um, and changing the black point is to just slide my shadow slider and you'll see how I'm getting detail back in the subjects here. Um, I don't think that I need to go all the way up or all the way down, but something that's a little bit, uh, a little more subtle, like 10 or 12 is nice because I can just see some strands of her hair. It's really, really lovely. Um, Terry, how would you describe the biggest difference between blacks and shadows? Well, the blacks of the photo are the darkest points without necessarily having details. Shadows still have mm -hmm. details. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I, it's always funny to me when I watch someone work in, I shouldn't say funny, it's always interesting to me when I watch someone work in curves because while I understand curves, I can demo curves. I can show you, tell you all about curves. I never use them because I just, there's, I just haven't found any benefit personally that curves will give me that I can't do a million other ways that seem easier to me. The thing about curves is it feels so all or nothing in this way. <laughs> like, well, it's, it's like you have to, it's, it's one of those things that's a checkbox. You have to have yep. curves or professionals won't respect it. Yep, yep, yep. But it's like, what are you doing that I couldn't do in, uh, with any of the other ways of doing it in Lightroom or, or Camera Raw or, what, or Photoshop? So it's like, oh, totally. it's a checkbox. It's there. I can show you how to use it, but it's like, I never, ever use curves. Not once have I said, aha, let's go to curves to do this. <laughs> That's just me. I, I, I'll admit it. It's just, it's Terry, you'll see. It makes me not a professional. <laughs> it's just not one time I thought, yes, curves is the answer for the thing I wanted. <laughs> Sorry. I'm laughing because um, it's just a funny It's. I mean, he's, he's right. Like, I um, I really use curves to do that black point thing and to do show one more thing I can show. But um, the reason why I showed you curves first was that I could show you exactly how I do the same thing in shadows, how I do the same thing in highlights. So if you look back, and if you're wondering why I'm using the iPad primarily, is I, I really enjoy it. Um, iPads are not cheap. I'm not encouraging you to buy one. But if you have one, um, you're not using Lightroom on it, I'd encourage you to. I really like the responsiveness of the pencil. Um, and honestly, what I do is if I have my normal workflow and this wasn't COVID, like let's say I was heading into town, into the city for a meeting on the train, um, I'd finish a shoot, like I'd, I'd finish shooting, I'd import my images, um, do month, day, year, like we talked about. And I would, um, 
I would wait for them to sync. And if you want to know how they sync in this top right corner, if you tap this, it would let me know, like I can get the original or um, whatever. But if I'm not in this window, let me hop out of it. Um, it'll say that I'm synced and backed up. Once I know I'm synced and backed up, then I can um, be on my phone. I can just make selects on my phone. So I can like say, oh, like I like this image. I can flag it, I can rate it. Um, and then when I want to sit down on uh, on my couch, maybe put on The Office, it's about to be off of um, Netflix. So hurry up, it's going to be gone in about a month and a half. Um, <laughs> it's going to be on Peacock, you can watch on Peacock. But um, I can sit and I can make really specific adjustments. And then, you know, later that night, once like, when I have had dinner, I'll sit down and I'll get them exported and give them to a client. But I really find the iPad to be like my favorite Lightroom experience. And also since I'm, well, once again, COVID, before I was flying a lot and have projects do, I would um, do this, which we did today, where I'd tap this bottom. And in the bottom, I can tap these three dots for each album. And it'll give me options to store it locally. And storing locally is that way so that for whatever reason, if I don't have service or the plain Wi-Fi is bad, um, I can make edits without having to worry um, what's going to happen. And then once I get back onto um, Wi-Fi, I can then edit from there. Um, and it just will, or back onto a network, it'll just sync the edits that I made here directly there. Um, and so, yeah, that's, I don't even know why I got into the iPad thing, but I just wanted to explain why I was using it. It's interesting. A bunch of people are obviously chiming in as to why, how they use curves and, it's all great. I, I'm not saying don't use curves. I'm just letting you know that I haven't found an advantage to curves over any other way that I would do something. That's all. I'm in, if you're I'm in curves, tears. Happy with curves, by all means, keep using curves. That's why we do the apps. This bit, you, I mean, you're not wrong. Photoshop on the iPad. It was one of the first features that people requested. They got to have curves in Photoshop on the iPad, so they got it in. I think I agree with you. I think people I say they like there. curves, but I'm not sure they actually do. Because I will say this, when you color edit with curves, it is a risky proposition. <laughs> but it's you know, challenging because, you, you know, and again, I think it's also too, if it's a workflow you've always used, obviously you're gonna wanna keep using that workflow. That's the workflow you're, you've grown up on. It's the one you've always used. You know what you're doing. You're getting it done. I'm not trying to take away from it. I'm just saying <laughs> I have a problem. A, a reason to use it over the many easier ways that they give us to do things now. That's very fair. Very, very fair. Um, <laughs> remember, Curves is no, in the No, I'm right. <laughs> he's not. He's not wrong. Um, the one I was going to bring up was just how I changed the black point. So down here at the very bottom. Okay, so it's something to pay attention to. If you talk, look at the top left corner, there's a histogram. And then this bottom right corner, see how I'm moving this black point? The histogram should be moving. I guess it's not going to, but um, essentially what's happening is I'm changing what the darkest, like what the, what Lightroom reads as the darkest part of the image, which is making those other dark points get a little bit lighter or even a little gray. Um, I enjoy kind of starting my image a little flat so that I know what I'm kind of working onto it. Um, and then if, for example, I want to change my white point, I can do that here by going down. So you'll see here, it's like making a, like a darker image. Um, these brighter points much grayer and are losing data. I'm not telling you, I, I often don't do this because I want to make sure I'm not um, messing with, I, I just think messing with my highlights is particularly dangerous, but let's just keep it here just for an example. Um, you can also do this simply by getting out of curves and moving my highlight slider in either direction. You'll see that if I have it all the way up, this is Look really at that. Happen. There's a slider called highlights specifically for that <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that some of the There's works one on called this. shadows. There's one called blacks. Wow, they've got individual sliders for all those things you were just talking about. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, you know what? Since Terry's dragging it, I'm going to bring one more point up that's pretty great. Um, while you're in, oh, is this just on the computer? It might be. The, um, hold on. Let's double check. Or maybe it's in a different spot. Terry, you know when you're um, in curves that you want to select a point? Yeah. Um, and then, told, oh yeah, I think it's just on the computer. Hold on, we're gonna switch over. Yeah, there might not be. A, there might not be a UI for that on. Yeah, it just it just might be difficult to show. So, um, uh, give me one second. I'm gonna. If I switch, can you see this? Can you see my the Lightroom desktop? 
Um, yep. The pink background. Okay. Um, just real quick, anyone that's watched me stream, I know that I'm still uh, kind of <laughs> dumpster fire, but I have gotten a lot better. And one thing that Terry showed me how to do is making sure that I zoom in. So um, let's make sure we get over here. We're looking at our curves. This is important. There's this little guy right here in this right corner called the target adjustment. So if you're having a hard time with curves and you want to play with it, this is the best thing I've found. If you tap this, you can go and move through your image. And if you look at the curve on the right, let me see if I can zoom in and show you. Yeah, it'll show you where that data yeah. is in the image. It'll show you where that data is in the image. And so this is helpful because if you're unsure, is this a mid-tone? Like, let, let's say like this actually leads in really well to split toning. I don't know, like, is this a mid-tone or not? Um, just look at where it hits on the curve. So here I know that this pink is a mid-tone, but I'm sure over here is a little bit darker or Kurt's mm -hmm. eyes will be um, in your highlights. Like, just this helps you kind of understand it. And let's say, for example, you say, oh, well, you know, I think this is too dark. Let me select this point. You can then start to drag and it'll edit the image on the curve for you. This will kind of give you an idea, like a baseline for how to use the curves, but also to get an idea of what you're looking at histogram wise and where uh, everything sits. Absolutely. Just, now, you know. well, I, no, back to the desktop for a second. I'm going to show you oh, the trick. Sorry. This is a hidden. Ooh. You can only know this if someone showed it to you because there's no way you discover it by accident. <laughs> this is. This is Built into both Lightroom and Lightroom Classic, in both the um, the blacks and the white sliders. Yeah. If you hold down your shift key and double click on the handle for each one, so double click on that one, and then double click on the other one, it will set the dynamic range for that photo based on what it thinks it should be for the blacks and the whites. Now this is a bad example. Let's pick a different image. <laughs> that was yeah. interesting. Shift key, double click, shift key, double click. Wow. Okay. And it will send it for you. But so again, it's what? It's I really just never, I use this app every day. I've never seen this before. Yeah. Well, because yeah, there's no how would you ever know to do that? Like, I never just, I'd never hold shift when I've been right. Thinking. You would never hold shift because either you're resetting the handle or you're dragging the handle. You would never hold down the shift key to double click the handle. So that's one of those little hidden things in Lightroom that I think they kind of put that there to help people that were making maybe transitioning or had never used curves as a way to kind of get those black and white points set automatically. Mm -hmm. And then you go from there. Mm -hmm. And it's important to have your black and white points set properly. Like, so for example, um, let me get out of this. Um, if you, and by the way, the, the only reason I remember to show it to you in that moment <laughs> is because you were on mobile and you didn't have the UI for the uh, targeted adjustment. Yep. 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 There's no, I, I don't know, maybe on an iPad with a keyboard, but there's no way to do that on mobile either because there's no shift key to hold down and double tap the handle. Yep, yep, yep. So I haven't found the equivalent on, on how to do that on mobile. And maybe, like I said, it might work with an iPad. Oh, here, let me launch Lightroom. Uh, oh, wow. So actually, if I hold if I hold shift, it gives me the option to auto everything if I want. That's super interesting. But first, right. so instead of autoing the whole um, at image, I could auto just the highlights or just the exposure or whatever I want. That's super interesting. Right. The re while yeah, it does, uh, go ahead. It doesn't do that on iPad. So I, so I know that's a desktop thing. And like I said, it's in both Lightroom and Lightroom Classic. But that's been there for years. And I think they, the team put that kind of feature in for the people that, again, don't work in curves or afraid of curves or intimidated by curves. <laughs> or in Terry's case, find curves to be the child that he never wanted. Um, no, no, And also, well, I, I, it may sound like I'm attacking curves. I'm not. You also have to remember, at the time levels and curves came out, there was no other way to do it. So there's that. Like, you, before all these features for shadows and, and camera raw and, and, and blacks and whites and all these sliders, before all that, all you had was levels and curves. So it, it, I'm giving respect to it. It's just today in 2020, I don't find as much use for it as I would have back in the 90s when there was no other option. Out of curiosity, Terry, what was the first Photoshop you or Lightroom you used, actually? I don't even know. Oh, in Lightroom. Lightroom one. <laughs> Lightroom one. What, what like, drew yeah, you was, to it? Well, I, I was, it was the... It was the new product for photographers, whereas Bridge had been the pr product we kind of all used. 
-hmm. But Adobe decided to make a tool specifically for photographers, and I was on board with you know version 1.0, even the betas before that. Nice. It was actually the first big public beta from Adobe because they wanted photographers wow. to have input on how the how the product was going to you know come to be. So it was all beta testers showing, telling Adobe what features they wanted, how they wanted it to look, how they wanted it to act. And that's how Lightroom got started over a decade ago. Nice, wow. I used Bridge in college and I think it was because our computers were old and uh, um, we think we had some kind of really crappy server. And so Bridge was always just so slow. <laughs> and so, um, like I said before, Lightroom is really like Bridge and Camera Raw's baby, but I find it really, really fun. And especially now that it's cloud-based over the last four years or so, three years, I found it to be a really good tool for me because often I'll, I have a request for an image while I'm out in Philadelphia and all my stuff is back in New York. Um, just mm -hmm. to put a bow on the curves and white point, dark black point conversation. Um, generally in your image, your, um, your viewer is going to look at the brightest part of the image, whether it's on purpose or not. And so you wanna make sure that you're eliminating distracting elements. Um, and so sometimes like, although this image is about a dancer, this window light that's reflecting off the ground can be like slightly distracting us. So something as small as um, not not here exactly because you realize how what happens when I turn the um, when I turn the highlights up and down. But if I were to just locally adjust here, um, here's a good a better a gooder a better example of the feather. The feather is essentially you see this inner circle. There's two um, concentric circles. The inner concentric circle is the brush that is the hard line, and the outer one is a lot softer, um, if much at all. So you see, we draw we'll draw through here just like we did before. Um, I'll hit zero like we talked about, or excuse me, I'll hit the letter Z, letter O like we talked about, and you'll see what I did, uh, what I'm drawing into. So we'll just draw over here. Then we'll go ahead and bring our highlights down just in this region. Hit O and you can see this kind of gross hard line because I made the line to, I didn't feather it enough, um, but you get an idea of exactly, you know, how you can use this. Um, to make sure that you're eliminating distractions in your image because you, your goal as a photographer is to translate your vision to the viewer. But something like if you take a photo, like if we look at a photo of this room, I might think that just that pink wall is cool. But if I take it at the wrong angle or if I include like this bright part of this window, you're going to be distracted by that. So um, using Photoshop, like using Lightroom, actually it's called Photoshop Lightroom. I forgot about that. Using Lightroom is um, will help you be able to really translate to your viewer exactly what beauty you're seeing, what you're focusing on. Cool. Cool. Any questions while I get out of curves and pretend that it never happened? Nope. Just people are reminiscing on the first versions of Photoshop and Lightroom that they ever used. Yeah, I think, uh, I wonder when CS... Three, four, five. What was the last CS we had before we went cloud? CS6. Okay. I wonder when they came out. So I think I had four when I went to college or five, something like that. But I don't remember. Anyway, so um, once again, we were, we were originally forever ago um, trying to make a couple different versions of this edit so you can see how versions works. So we have some light features we like. Um, we're gonna bring our vibrance up. I mean, earlier I was talking about exposure and saturation being dumb tools. By what that, by what I mean by that is, when I go over to my exposure, it just makes all values brighter, all values darker. Um, but highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks, even contrast, um, works just a little bit more intelligently. So, like you'll see here, I'm gonna adjust my shadows up. But for the most part, the what's on Maria's face doesn't really change all that much. Um, and the reason for the reason why I like that is it allows you more control over certain values without being um, destructive of the overall image. Um, because maybe in the past you would have dodged or burned that. And for the folks that don't know what that means, really quickly, if you are in a, a dark room, if I took a picture of Terry for some reason, I took a picture of Terry with my Canon AE-1, um, a film photo, and the first time I printed it out, I noticed that I had Terry backlit, so he just looked a shadow. Then dodging would essentially be like if I cut out a piece of paper, whatever there's anything in here I can use. You essentially would like use something. There's an enlarger that's like a lamp. If you like see this, oh, it's a dash, you can't do that. But essentially there's like a lamp of light that would shine down. You use um, a piece of paper or something to just 
run over the area that Terry was in to give it less light so that next time um, I exposed it in the developing paper, that area would be brighter because it got less overall exposure time. And burning would be the opposite. You get a piece of paper or something, you cut a hole in it, and then you just make sure that just this spot was getting a ton more light than everywhere else. Um, and burning is to make things darker and dodging to make things brighter. So dodging meaning you're trying to have that area dodge light and burning meaning you're burning into it, kind of like a, a malicious kid that's trying to burn ants with a magnifying glass. Um, so whereas I used to have to do that, now I can say without having to jump like into it an intense amount, I can just alter my uh, shadows and still keep the integrity of the highlights along her face. Now, I saw someone when we were having a curves discussion say that they use curves to do dodging and burning, and that brought made me, made me think about it. Of course, in Photoshop, I use dodge and burn tools, but 100%. how would you dodge and burn in Lightroom since you don't have the dodge and burn tools? Look at this guy. T Terry is just laying it up for me. Yeah, All there right, you go. So, so. As a <laughs> Well, actually, it was one of the one of the uh, one of the people in the chat laid it up for you. This made me think about it. So, um, in Photoshop, Terry, do you think it'd be helpful for me to open Photoshop to show that too, real quick? It no? certainly can't hurt. Okay. <laughs> um, can we dodge and burn in Photoshop on the iPad? Um, no. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, what'd you say? I thought you meant on desktop. So here, I'll I'll open up a photo on desktop and show. Okay. It. No, no, no. I was also going to show it on desktop, but I was going to say that I don't have Lightroom open, um, and I don't want to make everyone wait a whole minute. So we'll have Terry show you instead. While I just stretch my neck. Yeah, well, you got to wait for me to open up a photo in it too. So okay. Well, while we wait, um, we yeah. can do some Terry White trivia. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Funny. Oh, you know what they changed? Was bugging me now. What? So here's a change that's driving me nuts. Before in Lightroom, before this update, you can hit Command E to edit in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now Command E is export. So I'm like hitting Command E, I see oh. the and it never opens up. Oh, and like, they changed that? Oh, oh whoa. Export. Thanks yeah, for now it's, that. would have that would have me well. Now it's Command yeah. Shift E or PC Control Shift E. It was Command E in Lightroom Classic to export. It still is in Classic, but in, in, in well, Lightroom, yeah, when I first switched to Lightroom, I was so confused because it didn't do anything. Yeah. And, well, and it did for a while, but now they switched that keyboard around because I keep hitting Command E. I'm like, why is my image never opening? Because it just exported one to. And like, I <laughs> when I finally figured it out, I went to the folder it was exporting. I had like seven photos in there. Just duplicates of it exporting every time I hit Command E. All oh, right, uh, here, I'll switch. I'll switch to mine for a second. So let's see it. I can't see it, but I trust you. All right, so I've got a photo open, and typically, what dodge and burn means is you want to take portions of the photo and you want to make it lighter or and or darker. So there's an actual dodge and burn tool for that. So there's the dodge tool, and there's the burn tool. The burn tool looks like a hand because you would cup your hand over the photo and and the uh i'm sorry the burn tool looks like the hand the dodge photo looks like that paddle that andre was describing mm -hmm. now uh, i typically don't do it on the image itself i usually duplicate the layer mm -hmm. and some people do a gray layer so i do a duplicate layer with um setting the blend mode to luminosity luminosity and setting uh maybe the opacity to like 50 percent so basically, you don't see any visual difference, but that's the layer I'm actually dodging and burning on. Then, for example, uh, I usually start off with the burn tool. And if I were to, um, let's make the brush a little smaller. If I were to uh, start brushing areas of this photo, you would start to see those areas get darker around the edges of her hair. So uh, again, it's just building up 50%. So it doesn't look like you did a lot. But when you turn it off, you can really see it brighten up. When you turn it back on, you can really see it get darker. Same thing if I switch to the dodge tool and I wanted to make, for example, this part of her eye a little brighter, maybe yeah. this part of her eye a little brighter, I could do that. Maybe that part of her forehead a little brighter and maybe this part under her chin a little brighter. So it's really, I use this like a almost like a contouring um, effect to just add a little bit more depth to my photos by making the areas that are already dark a little darker, making the areas that are already light a little lighter, uh, just adding that little little bit of depth there. So again, 
doesn't it doesn't look like it made a big difference uh, when you're looking at it as you're doing it. But as soon as you turn that layer off, it's night and day when you can see yeah. what it did. So that's that's what dodge and burn traditionally was. And again, when the person said they use curves for that, I was like, well, I just use the dodge and burn tools for that. But in Lightroom, we don't have those dodge and burn tools. So we do not. That, I will show you how I do it. Up, <laughs> that's keying up Andre to show his process. So, um, Terry, let me know if you can show this, but maybe ju just for example's sake, I'm actually going to show. Let me see. Um, can you see the flash on my f on my phone on right now? Yep. Okay. So uh, the way that we would do film photography is this would be like an enlarger, and essentially you'd slide a negative. So you take a photo, then you develop it, and it would make like a little negative. You'd slide that right into this area that's right um, between the light and then it would project down onto a piece of paper. And depending on the image, you could, how dark the image was, how light the image was, you would expose for a certain amount of time. So like three seconds, five seconds, 12 seconds, whatever. Um, but if you knew that this, maybe this left area of the image was really, really dark, what you would do is you'd expose the whole thing for a certain period of time, like five seconds. And then this side, you would just, after two seconds, start moving your hand over it. Not long enough, because if you kept your hand still, it would make the impression of your fingers. But if you kept moving, some of that light would still creep in, creep up, and you're dodging the light so that that area wasn't getting exposed as much. Um, I hope that you can see this. If you've never done it before, it's actually kind of a weird experience. <laughs> but it's a cool I've one. Because it's, I've, it's very... I've, I've heard of it being done. Dude, Terry, we should do it together. I think that, that would be such a fun no, video. We're good. I never want to touch film again. We're good. The only problem with film for me was I used to hate getting the chemicals on my like clothes. But then again, at that point, I was poor, so none of my clothes really mattered. Like I was like college, like wearing middle school zip ups and stuff. Um, and then burning would be if I knew that this other area was too light and you essentially make like a little hole and then you, everything else is blocked and you're just moving your hands so like you're just burning light in this one spot so that's what that looks like um people make different tools depending on how big or small it is but that's what we mean so we're not doing any of that we are taking photos on camera 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 or computer cameras as michael scott says in the office um or digital cameras as regular people say dslrs and mirrorless cameras and um iphones and samsung's and google pixels right um and so instead if we say here Man, you know, I can see a little bit of the slide in Maria's face, but I want to brighten it up. What am I going to do, right? Like, I can't, I could use curves. I, I actually never thought about using curves that way. But instead, if you remember the tool that we discussed pretty early was the adjustment brush. So here in the adjustment brush, what we can do is we can just hit plus, and this, um, these little options will pop out. So one gives you a brush. One allows you to do a radial gradient, so like a circular one, and one allows you to do a linear gradient, which is a linear one. I don't want to do those. I want to go back to my brush so I can specifically select something. So let's go ahead and start painting over this spot. So uh, with folks' eyes, I get just get like right underneath them a little bit and then right inside of them. So we're going to just going to paint her eyes. Um, normally, I would paint the two eyes separately because this one's getting a little bit of light, a little bit more light than the other. Yeah, I was going to say that because they're not unless they're perfectly evenly lit, yeah. if you do them both at the same time, you're just gonna yeah. make we'll it just, I'll just Yeah, I'll just show the example then. Because I was, I was like gonna, I was like, let me just do them separately. So what I do instead is um, now I can control this one area. So remember with this brush, I can be like, oh, you know what? I want this person to look like a, like a, a mummy missing an eye. Nah, I'm good. Remember also in Lightroom, if you double tap the slider, it'll go back to normal. You can just go ahead and bring it up in exposure. I remember I called exposure a dumb tool, but if you guide it, it's not a dumb tool. It does what you want. Um, you notice if you go too far, it'll start to get noticeable because it's only editing that one area. Um, and that's where the feather comes in. Um, but I didn't feather that much here. So just here as an example, um, if we hit done, you'll see the example, the difference in just a little bit of little softness around her eye. Um, and you can see her eye a little, just a little bit better. Now, I need to feather here because you can you can see very clearly what the line is between where the edit started and ended, so here and here. But just as an example, so let's go ahead and fix it and do a better job on her right eye. We're going to go back to our adjustment brush, we're going to hit plus, we're going to hit brush. This lets us change the size. This lets us change the feather. So as you see, this feather zero, it's a harder line. We're going to bring the feather 
uh, like 75, and then this changes the flow, so how strong it is. The higher the, the higher the number of the flow, the more like, think about it kind of like a faucet or a hose, the higher the number is the more water or pressure or more liquid or whatever you're getting. So here now, let's try this again. Oh, I made that brush way too big. I don't know what that reminder is, but it should leave me alone. Go ahead and bring that size down. And then let's color this spot in best we can. So now it seems big, but if you zoom out, you notice that it's reasonably accurate. The feather still, once again, lets us know that this middle area is what's being affected the most and the edges just slightly. Um, and I you can just bring my exposure up a stop or two and zoom out. And actually this looks a little, little bit more natural than the other one. Um, if you're not sure, we can press and hold, but just a little difference in just being able to see um, her eyes. Eyes are how you establish trust. Um, and so when you're taking portraits, I was gonna make sure that my eyes are clear, clean, um, and have enough light so that they're not raccoon eyes and I can see exactly what you look like. Now, if you have a lot of bags in your eyes like me, maybe don't brighten them up, but for most people, it's definitely helpful. Right, and also, um, and that's what I've shown people in retouching for years, that a lot of times, just not even so much exposure, but just um, sharpening the eye will make it look a little brighter. Because yep. if you think about something that's like slightly out of focus, maybe, maybe it's not that noticeable, but if it's out of focus, it's gonna be in effect blurry. And therefore it's blurring the light. The light is not as sharp mm -hmm. versus sharpening the eyes um, can make a big difference in terms of just how well they look lit as well. Yep, yep. Can you, Terry, can, uh, actually I've been meaning to ask you about this. I think that that happens more with clarity. And I was curious why you think that, I, I think there's times clarity gives me not only that look of, sh of like, sh like a slightly less aggressive sharpen, but like a level of contrast, not like that feels even more manageable. Do you, do you like feel that way? Do you not use clarity? Do you like texture more? I don't know. Well, it, they're, they both do different things because people thought, oh, now that there's texture, I, I don't need clarity anymore. And it's and you notice that we added, added texture, but we didn't take the clarity slider away. We didn't replace it. That's because clarity, as you've noticed, does not only make the image look sharper or less sharp, but it also does tonal adjustments. Texture does not. So texture is straight up just the texture. That's it keeps the image as dark as it was or as bright as it was. It doesn't make any changes whatsoever. But clarity will also make the, the shadows a little darker, the highlights a little brighter. So it's gonna make some tonal adjustments that if that's what you need, great, yep. use clarity. If you don't, use texture. I like to avoid, I don't use clarity or sharpening too, too much on portraits because I think that those tonal adjustments can come up in strange ways on folks' faces. But I think texture is a nice medium because like you said, it avoids those tonal adjustments. So we're not like, essentially like if we still had that blemish there, if I had clarity, our sharpening would just make it look like a crazy wart. But as you see, as we're moving with clarity, it's not only sharpening, but because it's causing, like if you look right here, even like look at the difference in how our eyebrows are kind of dealt with. We go to like around zero and you'll see that Essentially, the eyebrows, the blacks are getting blacker and the edges are getting a little bit wider. And so it's just creating this environment where there is contrast in the midtones, um, which I think Clarity does a really good job on. But I think when doing it with a face, it can end up with a, a specific style that I'm not super interested in. So if I slide Clarity all the way up, you'll see it just feels too aggressive, in my opinion. But texture, um, I think, can give me a little bit of texture without being like super unforgiving. Right, and I think it also depends on the subject. Yep, yep, so, yep. Um, hang on for a minute here. That's weird. I'm trying to do something that, oh, there it is. Okay, I was like trying to bring up the marquee, the new marquee selection in Lightroom on desktop and it wasn't working, but now it is. All right, let me just try something really quick before I show you guys. So if I go down to effects, there we are. And I just crank up the clay. Yeah, there we are. We can see the difference right away. And if I go to texture instead. Yeah, okay. I got a perfect example to show the difference. All right. Um, so 
like you were talking about what, what you, you don't like what it might do to her. And it's I think it's typically because we don't want to we typically don't want to over sharpen female subjects. You know, they're they're just like you wouldn't over sharpen a baby. You want the skin to remain soft to look. You wouldn't have you wouldn't um, over sharpen a baby. I, I wouldn't over sharpen a baby. Right, right. But guys, no one cares. So <laughs> if it's a guy, I you go to town. Cares. Nobody cares. So, for example, in this image, uh, I'll just show you the difference in the two sliders. Before, all we had was clarity. So, if I were to drag the clarity slider, get some more clarity. Now, if I crank it all the way up, you can really see what it's starting to do to the shadows and highlights. It's just, it, it, just making them darker and making them brighter. It's doing, you know, it's just adjusting both. So, that's 100% clarity, which is, of course, too much. But if I do that same thing with texture, he just gets sharper. It does not affect the um, shadows and, and highlights nearly as much as it did with clarity. So it just depends on what you're trying to do as to which slider you're doing it on and also the subject. So this is something I probably wouldn't do to a feminine subject, but I would absolutely do, do to a male subject or an object or architecture or anything like that. I'd go to town with texture or, or clarity or both. Uh, sometimes I use a little of both depending on what the image is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Back to your image. Yeah, and I think I think Max has a link about that. That ooh, do you have that handy? Here, go ahead and leave your window up. I'm just gonna Max has a, a description of how he uses it. I'm gonna just pull it up and then drop into the chat one second. All right, no problem. It's like it's the best way I've seen. Um described. So um, while we're here, uh, one of the features that did get introduced in Lightroom um, Lightroom Desktop is that, and this is available in Lightroom Classic as well, the, the just the, the shortcuts that are different. So for example, in Lightroom uh, Desktop, if I just hold down the magnifying tool, then it switches to a little scrubby slider that goes left and right. I can actually scrub and zoom in and zoom all the way out on my image. So very nice to be able to do this. It also works with um, your scroll wheels and scroll buttons on your mice. So just holding down the button gives me that scrubby slider. Also what's new is if you hold down your command key on Mac, PC control key, then you get a marquee. So you can zoom in to a very specific area of the photo that way. Before you always had this one to one, one to two, one to three, like very specific mm -hmm, zoom mm -hmm, ratios. Mm -hmm. And you really didn't have a good way to get in between. Now it's zooms more like Photoshop, where you can just zoom to whatever you want. Now in Lightroom Classic, in the loop view, which is in the library, you don't have the scrubby slider, but you do have a tool in the toolbar called Zoom. So you can just move it back and forth that way. And then the develop module, you hold down the shift key to get to the scrubby slider. And the command key works for the marquee the same way. Nice. That's really helpful. That's super accurate. I have found that Zoom to be really irritating <laughs> in yeah. the past. And it's tough because yeah. it's way easier to zoom on um, on a tablet or phone device than it was on a right, desktop. Right, because you're zoom. Yeah. That's yep. why it's a desktop feature, because you already had easier ways to zoom on your mobile devices. Yep, 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 yep. All right, we got about 16 minutes left. What are you going to show us next? Oh, whoa. Wow, that really crept up. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right, so I'm gonna finish up making this version. The second edit I'm gonna make is gonna be a little bit more whimsical, just so we see an example. Um, Dehaze is interesting because sometimes I feel like it gives me, when I add a plus, it gives me a little bit more color. Um, like I just slid up my Dehaze just slightly and you're seeing like it made the screen a little bit calmer. I'm gonna go ahead and um, go to my color mix. I'm gonna make my green just a little bit more yellow because I just, I, I think it looks nice, a little desaturated, like a little bit of that desaturated yellow. Um, and then something else to point out that I'd like to explain is that for color mix, the HSL sliders, hue is one of the only words where I think you kind of just, you always define it with the word. You're just altering the hue. Hue is, I, I almost think of it as the, the adjacent, to alter the color you're on, you start to veer toward adjacent colors. So for green, I can get to a more yellow green or more blue green. And obviously when you mix yellow and blue together, you get green. And so you can kind of march in either direction. 
and each color that you have, it allows you to get closer to the colors nearby it. And if you look, like for example, um, orange, for example, the colors are next to it are red and yellow. So you can make orange more orange, or I mean, or more red or more yellow. Um, it is really governed by the colors around it, but I think color mix is a good way to understand how many colors go into making a successful photograph. So we made our green, um, which is a little bit, it changed the hue just ever so slightly. Saturation allows you to change the, the overall, um, how saturated the color is. I understand that that is the thing that you would assume you can do with color mix, but I believe that luminance is actually one of the more most helpful pieces because sometimes it's something your color is too saturated is that it's too dark or too light. So you see as you come through, you brighten, you brighten the color up, uh, what happens versus making a little bit darker like instead of necessarily making it more saturated it could just be that, that color needs a little bit of luminance so we have something we like we have we added our texture just going to add a little bit of contrast so we're going to go from here to here um then we're going to go back to versions I hit create version and we're going to say final export one we love that cool then we want to go over and we'll do one really wild one. So I'm just going to kind of move things with impunity, which that looks terrible. So I can't, I'm not going to go wild to the point where it's just madness. This is madness. And then Just for an example, that I want to go back to versions. I want to hit create version. I'm going to say never again because no one should ever do this. Hit create. And by do this, I mean this edit. And now I can toggle between what I've made. But let's say we want this really wild one for um, Instagram, which we know is four by five. So we apply that and we go back to versions. We know that, uh, let's say we want vivid test for something else. So we're going to go back to aspect ratio. Um, we'll just make it a square. Hit done. Let me go back to versions and you'll see that we have, oh, I actually forgot to save it. Apologies. You see that we have the options of never again final export, Vivid, et cetera, like all the things that I set are available to me. And that is helpful because these versions are available on across your devices, not just what you, um, not just what you were making it immediately at that time. And so I, I think it's like a really cool feature because it allows you to have the um, latitude to try a lot of different things and then also be able to just look at them um, and make us make a good decision from there without having to re-import and like just make make a do like an extra five minutes of work to do the work that you want to do um so to answer your question kind of finally terry i think this is my favorite new feature all right so <laughs> we're going to get out of this we're going to go back to color this looks awful let's just go back to the original image um and we're going to talk about color mix but i assume that given the fact that we have 17 minutes left or 10 minutes, i forget exactly how much time we have them um we got 11 minutes left now Okay, 11 minutes left, excuse me, um, not color mix. We're going to go to color grading that we're going to probably end on it today and start it tomorrow. But just to give you a quick little look, um, Mr. White, would you so kindly explain to the folks what these three dots are? I think they know, but let's pretend that they don't. So uh, first of all, just to give you a feel for what color grading is and um, why it's important. It's actually something you see all the time. You see, you've yeah. seen it for the last decade and just about every every movie you've ever seen. And of course, most TV shows, especially if they're shot outside. Um, if you think about it, like, for example, I'm a Game of Thrones fan. If you think about Game of Thrones and you think about, you know, the, uh, the, the winter is coming because that was one of the famous things. Winter looked super cold. It looked like yeah. it was always freezing no matter what day it was. Sun up, sun down, it was super cold because the scenes were bluer. It just made it feel colder, even though those scenes could have been shot in the middle of July. They felt super cold. And it was because of the color grading applied to that movie or that uh, TV show. So yep. if you think about stills, 
shot in a, in, and taking uh, still photography is, is really just storytelling. You think about wanting to tell a story with shots taken in different places at different times, but you all wanted mm -hmm. to feel a certain way, then you would make it that color to feel that way. So obviously, if you want to feel hot or summertime, you make it more yellowish and more orangish. You would do those mm -hmm. kind of things to it to make it feel that way. So the color grading wheels in Lightroom are, are designed to do just that with your shadows, midtones, and highlights. You've got the entire color spectrum to apply uh, to any one of those areas <clears throat> or all of those areas of the photo, including a slider for balance and a, sl and a sliders for amount. So that's what color grading is in a nutshell. And the reason it's been brought into Lightroom and mm -hmm. replacing split toning is to give photographers that professional level of being able to color grade photos and do it um, in a workflow, doing yeah. multiple photos at the same time, saving it as a preset, applying yeah. that preset to several photos at once, having it work on mobile. It's just, it just, it's a win-win for everybody. It is. And like that point you brought up about different light um, sources, I was going to show this tomorrow or I, I was going to show it today, but I always run out of time and just get excited about too many things. But um, I just wanted to bring this up. I photographed this home. And this is the thing I want to show, and we're going to use it for geometry tomorrow, Terry, because I don't think I have time to do that. But um, this was totally something I thought you'd be into. It is a house made out of shipping containers that I photographed last week for an architect. <laughs> okay. It's pretty cool. Um, and they like, it was it was actually pretty rad. But we got there in the middle of the day, and we photographed all day. So you can see that our original images are a little bit brighter. And toward the end of the day, we have some things at night. But um, you'll see that all the interior images, I gave a color grade treatment that felt very... Let me get a good example that felt very warm, a little yellow. I wanted it to feel very Southwest because that was kind of how they had designed the home. And so the lighting source, the lighting was a little bit different throughout, but um, when you make the edits, the goal is for it to feel continuous and like throughout a story. And so when Terry's talking about um, understanding what the color grade can do, like if you see these as examples, um, I chose this because it felt like Southwest or maybe like this is like a very Airbnb look like these like really crushed highlights and um, kind of overly yellow. Um, but it was a color grade that I thought was kind of cool. Um, and so uh, we're going to talk about some basics of it. And then tomorrow we'll touch into it. And I'm assuming Terry and I will probably alternate using it on some of your images. So if you once again haven't submitted any photos to. Um, oh, yeah. Let me get that link together. I was supposed to share that. Yeah. Link. <laughs> that was my bad. I've just been talking away, so it's it's hard to remember what we're supposed to be talking about. Um, but if you want to um, have us edit some of your photos, we're going to be using the color grade tool uh, tomorrow. And so um, today we're just going to kind of set it up and like, please come back tomorrow. You don't have to. You can always watch it later, but I promise I'm much more fun live um, and I'm happy to answer your questions. So just as an example, you look through this. This is an image taken, obviously, as the sun is going down a little bit more, you're getting some beautiful light coming in. Um, but it still feels very, um, it has the same feel that we're, that we're discussing, even as the lighting changed. So earlier in the day, when the sun is still high, you'll see that inside the house, you are getting that same um, light coming, directional light coming in. But we still try to keep everything feeling similar, um, which seems like obvious because the house is the same, but as your light changes, the temperature of the light changes, the feel of light changes. So color grading can give you that latitude to make sure that you have the, trunk, the exact control that you want. So um, we will talk about it later, but um, Terry, you seem unimpressed with the shipping container house. I, that was the thing, one thing I was excited No, about. it was cool. I, I'm, I'm putting the link in the chat. So it's not that I'm unimpressed. I was, I was taking the task on that you just reminded me of. No, um, it's, it's a very cool project. Oh, but the, like, the first thing that comes to mind is like, is it noisy because it's made out of metal? So like, it just brings up a million questions. So it was actually pretty interesting. So the, just to touch on it really quick, um, this architect that's now a friend of mine, um, Ada over at um, at Low Tech, their, their whole idea is to make like things that are sustainable. And since shipping containers, um, you can't really recycle them. You make them to like ship things internationally and they're used for years and years and then they like get new ones. Um, they essentially like sealed it, they cut into it. Um, I don't know how much architecture you understand, but I don't a lot, but they brought up the point that having the windows be um, at an angle is actually better structurally. And so they just 
these these folks that bought this land, they placed it on the land. The coolest thing to me was that instead of having like instead of having to drill into it to hang most of the things you see, like the TV or on the plant, they just use really powerful magnets because these things are made out of straight steel, oh, which is okay. really shocking. Um, yeah, but it, it wasn't it wasn't super loud, no, because it was like it's like uh, insulated and there's well, like yeah, wood. I'm sure there's insulation, right? Yeah. Yeah, but it was cool. It was just, I, I don't know if I'd live here, but it was like a really cool thing to photograph and watch how the sun kind of hit it throughout the day and how deep these colors were. So we're, we're going to use this tomorrow. Yeah, by the way, the speaking of sun, like, I wonder just like, because on the one yeah. hand you're using, you're recycling something, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's something made out of metal, which like mm -hmm. just, that's got to be a heat magnet in the summertime. So does it make you have to crank up the AC more? It's just... Like I said, it brings up a million questions I have to ask you offline. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. Yeah, sorry. I, I was excited to bring shows to Terry, but um, I just want to show this as an example. And tomorrow I'm going to bring it up because I used the geometry tool a lot with this because it was interesting to just see how there's all these like lines and just making sure that I maybe had balanced an image on a single line, but then using geometry helped me um, get it exactly perfect because I'm still figuring out how I want to do landscapes and architecture related photography. But um, just to get back to um, color grading, we'll go back to the photo of Maria. We're using it as an example. Uh, just so you know, tomorrow we'll be touching on. We have a bunch of other colors to mess with in here as well. Oh, you do killer. It's all, as well as some group photos, but we'll get to that later. Let's get back to this photo. Um, and so what I was alluding to, and Terry mentioned, uh, these three dots, um, let you know, just like we, we had said from earlier when whichever kind soul asked about these features, shadows, midtones, highlights. It'll tell you right here what they are, but also if you look at the options, highlights are going to be the brightest ones, obviously the white, midtones are the grays, and, shadow, and uh, shadows are this, this black. And then obviously all the way over here, this is global, which adjusts everything. Um, I'm not sure I would do global because it, in some way it kind of defeats the purpose of this, in my opinion. But um, right. let's say, for example, I mean, no judgment. I'm just saying, like, if, if we're going to get into the color grading tool, why would I do a global edit? Um, so let's say here, for example, I just wanted to alter the mood of this. So I just want my highlights to change. You notice that if I go to orange, um, the other side of Maria's face, so it's maybe a little bit. It was a little bit, uh, it was just white because it was had, I had a little bit of highlight from the window. If I just bring it in, you'll see that I'm finding a color that's very similar to her skin tone. Um, but as we move throughout, like I find this tool to be helpful because it's super responsive um, and you can just play with it and it's not this hella stressful thing. And if you press and go slowly, it'll kind of show you what it wants to do. Um, and so now the highlights I've made are a little bit closer to her skin tone. But then let's say that we wanted to give this like uh, a cross process feel, which feel, which is like um, a certain kind of film or a certain way you process it, so the colors would be really wild. So if we chose yellow here, let's go to the opposite side of the spectrum to blue. Let's make our shadows a blue, um, something that well, that's a little strong. So now we have an image. So I think I have to actually close it to get my before and after. But as you're going slowly, you'll see like it'll just give you a couple features that um, you can use. Oh, excuse me. Um, it's just showing you what color you are. If you see the outside of the circle as you move, it'll just show you exactly what color you're getting to. Um, and then mm -hmm. the point that you're hitting is showing you the couple, your couple, um, the color that you're sampling. I keep pulling up when I'm pulling off of this. So this cross process is a little dramatic. I'm not sure I would necessarily do this, but sometimes I think it's cool to use split zone to uh, use colors from different sides of the spectrum. And then for the shadows, I can alter the luminance of this color to make it, like we said, um, brighter or darker. And you notice if I bring the luminance down a little bit, it looks a little bit more natural. So I can actually make that blue a little deeper, a little bit less deep. And you'll see that even in her hair now, it goes to this blue. There's like the shadow has this uh, cast of color. Very cool. All right. And with that, that was perfect end because we are out of time. We're going to wrap Ugh. things up right now. It never ceases to amaze me how I never know what time it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just uh, going. 
<laughs> anyway, it was a fun day one. So guys, yeah. if you want to um, submit photos for Andre to edit for tomorrow's session in the Dropbox. We got quite a few submissions already. Mm -hmm. um, or I put the Dropbox link there. Uh, and we won't get to everything. And just because you submit a photo doesn't mean guarantee that it's going to get edited. But we'll certainly get through as many as we can in the time we have tomorrow. We'll uh, so you get a chance to see. Yeah, well, you'll see. Right. You'll see the editing process. And again, uh, it was funny when I did this session on, on my um, on my photography masterclass. I had, I had the, one of the people that submitted a photo was actually watching and commenting. And they were like, well, I'd crop it differently. And I had to remind them. I said, this is how I would edit your photos. Not how you would edit your photos. <laughs> you already know what you would do. <laughs> this, is, this is me <laughs> taking your photos. <laughs> I would do. Oh, man. So it was, we had a good time with it. Um, and at the end of the day, she was right. Like I, after I cropped it my way, and then I kind of like looked at the photo. I was like, oh, you know what? You're right. This this should be a horizontal crop. So, and then there were people disagreeing. They were like, oh no, Terry, we liked her way better. So it's it is subjective, is what I'm trying to say. And it's uh, you take it with a grain of salt. This is just our yeah. process or Andre's process of how we would edit your photos. So with that said, join us tomorrow for that and stay tuned for, I forgot whatever's next. What's next after us? The Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge. So stay tuned for that. And we will see you guys tomorrow. So hang tight. We'll be back tomorrow. And Illustrator Creative Challenge is up next. Cheers, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks, Andre.